בשם אדוני, מלך הכבוד. Blessed are you, blessed are you, just sing that out. Blessed are you, King of honor. Blessed are you, Blessed are you, Blessed are you, Hallelujah. Okay, so in the last chapter, Ehud, that's a kind of a cool name, Ehud. Ehud sounds tough. Uh, he killed the king that was oppressing Israel for all that time. He stabbed him in the gut and he got away. And the Lord or orchestrated the whole thing for him to be able to get away. And so uh, Israel's former oppressor died. And they had a lot of peace because of Ehud. But the pattern that we're seeing in Judges is that while a judge lived, everybody was all right. But when that judge went, when he died, everybody goes crazy again. And that's just the way it went. And so uh, it's important that we look in uh, Judges 4.1. It's reemphasizing that pattern to us again in that it says in Judges 4.1 that when Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Here we go again. That's what I think of when I read this stuff. Uh, the, the reiteration from back in Judges 2.19. Judges 2.19 told us when the judge died, everybody got worse. They reverted more corruptly and more sinful than the time before. So this is a continual downward spiral. You know, I went down a water slide one time, but I caught myself on the edge, but you can only hold yourself for so long because the water is going to build up behind you and eventually going to shove you again. They are on a downward spiral no matter what. And the judges gave, I guess, somewhat of a temporary relief at, at times. But it's kind of like when the cat's away, the mice will play. So Ehud's gone, and everybody's going crazy again. And one thing I like about this is that it shows us what a profound influence that just one godly guy can have on a whole nation. Just one guy. That could be you, men. I don't know. That could be you. This ought to show us how much of an impact that just you alone can be if you'll just follow the Lord and do what he tells you to do. So that's the good side of verse 1. But the bad side is that it shows Israel in the downward spiral. And every time a judge came along, he delivered Israel. And as soon as the judge is gone, everybody goes worse than they were. So even though judges are providing some godly periods of peace and relief, the downward spiral is still there. It's still going down as a nation. Uh, they're getting worse. I mean, this is getting worse. So that means each time this happens, we're in a worse scenario than we were. We're worse now than we were in Joshua's time. We're worse now than we were at, at Othniel's time because now it's worse each and every time. And so... But as long as God had a judge in front of them, they listen. As long as a judge is there, they will listen. But not until after they've been put through the pressure cooker first. They have to go through extremities, and then here comes the judge, and they're so hurt and beat up, now they'll listen to that judge. You ever been through something like that in your life? That God tried to pull you out of a bad thing that you were doing, you were willfully doing it, you didn't care, I like it, I want it, so boom, here comes bad times. And all of a sudden it gets so bad that now I'm willing to listen to that pastor, I'm willing to listen to that Christian friend, I'm willing to finally listen to that guy on the radio or TV, because I can't take this anymore. We're, guys, we are just like Israel. Don't point at them and go, oh, you Israelites. We're the same thing, the same thing. So they wouldn't listen until they got put through pressure first. And, I, and this is the problem we have in America today. People are just not listening. They're not listening to people that God has put in front of them. They just don't want to hear it. I'm talking about the majority scale. Don't jump up and run out of here. Oh, I can't believe Ray said that about me. I'm not talking about y'all. The majority of the nation out there, they just don't want to hear it. They hate the word repent. I've got a lot of friends that are Christian, and they say they go to church, and they believe in Jesus, and all that stuff, but they, but they will ask me this question. Why do you always talk about repentance all the time? 
it's like it just burns them up to hear me talk about that. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> funny you should pick that one word to get upset about because you don't want to listen. You don't want to turn. And it's a downward spiral, worse and worse. And Israel is doing it here in Judges 4. They are spiraling down worse and further each time. So now Judges 4 and 2. So, now get this, y'all ready? Here's this, well, my God would never do this. Well, look at what he does. Verse 2, so the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Harasheth Hagoyim. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Oh, look, here we go again. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Here goes this pattern all over again. Here we go again. So the Lord delivered Israel out of oppression in Egypt. We remember that. That's the big way. Everybody remembers that. The Lord delivered Israel out of Egypt. He took them out of slavery and everything was fine ever since. No, it wasn't. Because what we're seeing right here, he delivered them out of slavery. I see the Lord selling Israel back into slavery. Do we often think of that one? The one we always think about is he took them out of slavery. Here's the Lord selling them back into it. Why? Because Israel has been repeatedly serving other gods. There are other things in their life that are higher up the priority list than God is. And when that happens, whatever it is, and I'm talking to all of us here, and I'm, I'm experienced in this one. If your job takes priority over God, if your money takes priority over God, if your boyfriend takes priority over God, your girlfriend, whatever, your status, your career, what, all these things that goes on, if it takes priority over God, you are serving false gods, you've got pressure coming. Why? Because God wants you. God wants you. Guys and girls, if you're married to somebody, you don't want them running around with somebody else. They better come back to me. <laughs> they better be staying at my house. God's like that. He goes, hey, I want you. You better come to me. And if you don't, I'm going to do things to get you to come to me. And you know what? You need to be thankful that God does this. Very thankful. So it's typical thinking that God saved Israel from slavery, but we rarely remember that he put them back into slavery because of their sin. Do not ever take advantage of God's grace. Well, I'm saved. I'm okay. I'll just go do what I want to. No. Because you're saved, you should get on your knees and say, God, what do you want me to do? Now, even if you're saved by Christ, delivered from the slavery of sin, do not provoke God's wrath by serving whatever these false gods in your life might be, or else he can sell you into slavery to your enemies again, and you don't want that. Trust me. Scripture says to keep with repentance, stick to it, stay close to the Lord, don't drift off into serving false gods, because as soon as you serve false gods, just like it says in the verse, you will start doing evil things. Well, it seems okay to me. Yeah, to you it does. Don't do that. God doesn't like that. He likes selfless humility. And saved or not, if you turn towards sin, He will do something about it. How many of you, if you're married or whatever, or your kids, whatever, run off and go on off with the wrong people, how many of you wouldn't do something about it? Uh-uh, I'm not having it. God does that. But it won't feel good if you do this and provoke his wrath, and it will get worse every time. I want us to take notice that in previous chapters, God handed Israel over to various kings, but it only says that Israel served those kings. Y'all remember that? It says, and they served king whatever his long name was. They served him. They served him. But look at verse 3 here in chapter 4. It doesn't say they're just serving King Jabin. It says he oppressed them harshly. You see how much bad, worse it's getting. It's not, oh, we'll just serve here. Here's your plate. Or I'll fix your horses up. No, it says he's harshly oppressing them. This is getting worse, guys. If you go to a restaurant and a waiter, let's say I go to a restaurant and the waiter serves me. I order something and he brings what I ordered. He, he comes in with it and, and, okay, that's serving me. But let's say if I went to the restaurant and let's say I beat the waiter with a whip back in the kitchen. I want that well done, man. You're not cooking that right. And I just beat the guy up. That's harsh oppression versus just serving me. Do you see the difference? Pretty severe. 
Do you see how the conditions of Israel's judgment is getting worse and worse to correspond with the continuation of their worsening sin? You see what's going on here? Guys, I can drag a lot out of a few words. And I'm trying to, because I want y'all to see how bad this line is dropping down on the graph. It's going down quick. Friends, I want to also tell you that God is no pushover. He is not no pushover. He's not going to put up with it. If you're his or going to be his, he's going to come get you relentlessly and thank God for it. He pursues his people, regardless of how bad they get. And be glad about this, because if God did not pursue you, you could not be saved. America, it's time to get to know the true God of the Bible and throw away that pansy pushover God that you invented because he does not exist. So God is not just wanting to shower everybody with roses and rainbows no matter what we do. He is a God that gets fierce about his people and he sells them into slavery to get them to turn. Did you know this about your God? Here he is. Let's get real and find out who God says he is. Romans 1.18 says... For the wrath of God is revealed. Does it say hidden? Does it say tucked away? Does it say he puts it away because he doesn't want to hurt your feelings? It says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God doesn't like his truth being pushed down and hidden away. So he's not hiding his wrath away on those who do it. He reveals it. Hello, here it is. That's revealing Sin makes God angry, and he sold his own people Israel off, not just to serving, but to harsh oppression. And friends, as a Gentile, I have to stress the point that if God would do this to his own chosen people of Israel, what do you think he would do to us as the foreigner? I'm not a Jew. I'm not Israeli, Israelite. I'm a Gentile. If he would do that to his chosen people, what do you think he'd do to us? Guys, whoo. We better get this down. This time the oppression was harsh. And when you see in verse 3 that this king had 900 chariots of iron, it really helps you understand that this was a really tough enemy here. This enemy was no pushover either. Harsh guys here. And Israel's hard-headedness from sin was so thick that they had to sit under this oppression for how long? How long does it say before they finally cried out to God? 20 years. 20 years. That's enough time for a kid to be born and go all the way through high school and take two years off. 20 years before they would finally cry out to the Lord. That's a long time. To what level of hard-headedness do people have to go through before they will finally cry out to God? How long do we have to let it run sometime? Like I've said before, isn't it better if we could just find it in ourselves to give honor to our God, to, 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 to give God our honor, to give God our praise, and to give God our time and just bow down to Him in thankfulness and live our lives in obedience without having to be run through the pressure cooker first? Why can't we just do that? Why can't we just say, God, I messed up. And I'm sorry, and I'm going to stop that mess, but I don't know how to fix it, so I just give my life to you, show me what to do, and let's go from there. Why do you have to wait for it to get so bad first? Why can't we just bow and get it over with? Give your life to Christ. How much mess that we could save ourselves if we would just cry out to the Lord without having to endure all that first? They went through 20 years. Did it have to be 20? Well, I guess so. I guess because they were thick, but there's no reason why it had to be 20. America, why don't we get down on our knees and repent? Judges 4 and 4. Okay, here's where we go. Here's where we go okay? Now, I want to say something about this story first before we get into it. There's, there's a, a thing going on in the nation that is out of godly order, and, and people, women in particular, will use this story because they've got Deborah. All right, we've got Deborah. She's our woman. Look at what Deborah does. But I want to show you what God's doing in this picture. So just bear with me, okay? Judges 4 and 4. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, if I said that right, was judging Israel at that time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Okay, so she's got a little courtroom here under this tree. 
And she's a judge. That is kind of like the president of the United States. They had military, uh, you know, judicial and ex- executive uh, powers, okay? So, but this is Deborah. It's a woman. She's the only woman judge Israel ever had. And a lot of people go, huh? What's up with this? Let's look at it. Because I want us to understand some things before we move on. Because Deborah's story, it, it stirs up a lot of controversy because she was a judge of Israel. Now, our modern culture today is way out of order. We remember Othniel and Oxa, how they got married and she submitted to Othniel like God's Word tells the woman to do. It's not about being better or superior. It's simply order. A comes before B, not because it's better. It's simply just order. Okay, that's all it is. God has an order of the way things work. Uh, if you try to bake a cake and you put the ingredients in out of order, it won't come out. <laughs> but a lot of people are trying to bake their cakes like that. you got to put it in order like the directions say. So there's a lot of women, they have used Deborah to stir up an argument over men's and women's leadership roles to confuse the roles and, and blur the lines, particularly in church. But we have to stay in the context here. We have to stay in the context. Remember, this is Israel's lowest, worst time of their history ever since they got out of Egypt. This is the worst it's ever been for them. Largely because of spineless men who refused to take up their leadership role that God expected of them. Now, I'm going to drill the men hard today because I am one, therefore I feel like I get to. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and when I see spineless men in our culture, it offends me as a man. It offends me. It burns me up because men ought to know better. We ought to be doing our role. But spineless men were not doing their leadership. And God holds men accountable to leadership. He holds you accountable. When you, men, when you don't do your job, like the Word says, He doesn't come after her. He'll come after you. And I want to show you an example of this. In the Garden of Eden... What happened after Adam and Eve both ate the forbidden fruit? Now, they both ate it, did they not? Both of them did. Matter of fact, Eve ate it first. But I want to show you what happens. Genesis 3, 9. It says, the Lord called to the man. Oh, buddy. He called to the man and said to him, where are you? Time to go to the principal's office. That's what that was. He didn't call out to Eve. Well, God, she ate the fruit too. As a matter of fact, Adam says, well, this woman you gave me, God didn't care. He said, hey, I told you to lead her. She's your helper. He he didn't call out to Eve. He called Adam. Why? Because the man is to lead. He is also the one who is held accountable. Oftentimes you hear people saying, I want to lead. I want to take charge. And they don't respect authority and they want to take their lead role. They're not thinking of the accountability that comes with it. It's heavy, heavy accountability. You never hear anybody take the standpoint that it is the man who has to take the heat of accountability. People often cry that the man gets to lead. Well, we take the heat as well. God called the man to give answers, not the woman. And then God told the woman, Genesis three sixteen. he says, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Do y'all see that? Do y- are y'all very acutely aware that I didn't write that? <laughs> I hope so. God said this, guys. If you have that attitude, well, I don't want no man telling me what to do. Well, I don't need no man. Guys, God said this. Sorry, but not sorry. He shall roll over you. I said it. Not a very popular teaching today, is it? I told you it's not very politically correct. But friends, I'm telling you this. I'm trying to tell you this so that you can have the opportunity to say, if I'm out of order, I need to get right. And God will bless you through that. Guys, I want you to get a blessing. I want you to be blessed. I don't want you through the pressure cooker anymore. This is, this is biblical good stuff. It's a blessing. So with this all being biblically established, a question now arises. The, we, have, we have biblically established that the man leads. The question comes up, why would God choose Deborah, a woman, to be judge of Israel? That's my question. Why did he put her in this after we see how God expects the man to lead? Okay, let's go into it, and y'all hang on. Here's where it gets fun. (laughs) I love it. This is where the Bible grabs me and really draws me in, and I love having the opportunity to just blow it out all over y'all on Sunday, so this is good. 
So why would God choose Deborah, a woman, to be judge of Israel? Well, I agree with this here. Deborah's position as Israel's only female judge was itself a judgment that God put upon the weak-willed men of Israel who would not take up their role. Deborah being a leader, a judge of Israel, it was to get the man to snap out of it. Look, I put a woman over you. Guys, get up and go do your job. Israel, remember, is in the worst downward, downward spiral they've ever been in here. And because Israel's men were too spineless to judge, God chose a woman to judge Israel for the purpose of shaming the men. Guys, you've ever been out on the playground at school and some girl could do something better than you did? What did that do to you? Uh uh-uh, uh, I'm going to do it better than she did. <laughs> this little competitive thing comes up. I think, I think that's what God's doing. He put a prophetess that could hear from God. The men are all wondering, well, can you hear from God? Oh, I can't hear from God. How come she can hear from God? Shouldn't that be us? Yeah, it should be you. He put Deborah up there to shame the men. And ladies, men having the leadership role, I want to say this again, it does not mean that men are superior. It doesn't mean that men are better. It doesn't mean this man, that men can come home and say, woman, where's my glass of tea? That's not what this means at all. And It also doesn't mean that if you perceive that he's not doing what you think he should be doing, this story of Deborah does not give you permission to jump in and take over. There's a godly order here that we have to follow. I've seen more marriages argue themselves to death and blow themselves apart over this very issue. I've seen it happen. And then they get in the church and they they blow the church into pieces too. So here's Deborah, whose name means honeybee. Now, when I think of a honeybee, I think of a productive worker. So that's probably going to be what Deborah is here. She's a productive worker. Her very name, walking around saying, hi, I'm honeybee, productive worker, a judge of Israel, her very name would have been a stark contrast against all the lazy men who were laying down on the job. (laughs) That would spur some action, you'd think, wouldn't it? So now as we read in verse 4, Deborah could prophesy. She's a prophetess. I mean, she could hear from God and speak uh, to, the, to, to the nation for him, which is a feature that the people, being able to prophesy is a feature that the people of Israel would want in a leader in this bad time. We need a leader that hears from God. Well, it looks like Deborah's it. Well, I guess she's got to lead. We, we got to hear from God. You see what God's doing? He put her in leadership position to get these men to stand up and do something. Now, I'm sure that her... Her ability to prophesy, speaking the words of the Lord, is majorly a part of what got Israel to set her up as a judge. I'm sure a lot of men resented her for it. But goodness, she hears from God. That's what we need. I'm sure underneath the under between the lines here, a lot of guys were fighting about this Deborah being a leader. Well, she speaks from God. We gotta have that. So she's in position. Now, she had a court about eight to ten miles north of Jerusalem in the mountains of Ephraim. Now, notice in verse 4, Deborah was a married woman, was she? She was a married woman. She's operating under God's order. In fact, her husband's name, if I'm saying it right, Lapidoth, means torch. When I think of a torch, I think of somebody who holds it up and says, follow me. Think of the Statue of Liberty. Y'all come this way. It's, It's a leader. It lights the way. His name means torch. This indicates that he was quite a leader himself. He had quite a leadership position in Israel as well. But the Bible doesn't give us any more information about him. We just know we can gather a lot from what his name means. So now Israel finally cries out to the Lord, and they run to see Deborah since she can prophesy. It says they all showed up because they, this is bad. we got to go hear from Deborah. What's going on? Deborah, tell us something. They want to see what God can do to deliver them again. What this means is Israel's starting to turn Israel's finally starting to turn. They're finally starting to repent, which is God wants. So here's what Deborah does about it in Judges 4 and 6 now. It says, Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded? 
Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. And against you, I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. Okay, I want to show you in this passage how carefully Deborah chose her words. Deborah's being very careful. She understands she's a married woman. She understands her leadership role that she can prophesy, but she understands that she's speaking to a man. And I want to show you what she's doing here. What she's doing here, she's not giving orders. Notice she is quoting what God said. Some people say she ordered Barak. No, she's quoting God. Um, don't make Deborah into a means of getting out of godly order. She's quoting God. In verse 6, look at what she said. She said, has not who? Has not the Lord of Israel commanded? Do you see that? Go and deploy troops. Has not the Lord commanded? Go and deploy troops. She didn't say, I command you to deploy troops. Deborah is a godly woman. She knows the order that God has established. She knows why she's there. It's to shame the men. And so she says, has not the Lord commanded? I just want you all to make sure you see that. Has not the Lord commanded? Go and deploy troops. Very important that we recognize exactly how Deborah is speaking. She's not commanding Barak. She's reminding Barak that the Lord God commanded this. Okay? Men and women, if you do not operate in God's order, you cannot receive the blessing. Well, I know things may feel somewhat okay right now, but if you're out of godly order, especially if you know it, (laughs) you know that little snag you have in your life that you just can't seem, why can't I seem to get rid of that? It's because you're out of order. Get in God's order. Deborah's operating in proper godly order. And I mean, if she doesn't, word's going to get back to her husband. I saw your wife give an order. Lapidoth's going to come up and say, hey, what, what are you doing? You, you've, got a, you've got a lot of accountability as a judge. She's operating right. But she's, she's giving God's commands on the exact strategy on how to win against their oppressive enemy. Here's how you do it. You got these, these bad guys. Here's how you get it. So Deborah summons a man named Barak from Kadesh and Naphtali. What is so important about this town? If the town is mentioned, why is it significant? Back in Joshua 20, do you remember when they were appointing cities of refuge? If you accidentally killed somebody, you could run to a city of refuge. They'd take you in, and you're safe. And the avenger of blood that's coming to kill you for killing accidentally his friend, you're safe in there. And there's a parallel that Jesus Christ is our refuge, that in him we're safe from the condemnation of sin. So Kadesh is a refuge city, and it's also the closest city to this enemy. Here's this big enemy out here. Kadesh is right over there. So it's a strategic move to take 10,000 troops and put them in a refuge city close to the enemy. This is military moving stuff here. Good stuff to do. And so it's the closest enemy. And Deborah reminds Barak that God ordered to put the troops on Mount Tabor. Put up Mount Tabor. I... Uh, fortunately, I have personally been to Mount Tabor. It's pretty cool. I rode out there with your dad. We were riding in a car, and he says, that's where Deborah and all that. So I've been to Mount Tabor, and it's about 1,300 feet up. And when you see how steep it rises and you see how rocky it is, you can understand why God said to put the troops way up there because the enemy has 900 chariots, and chariots don't work too good when they're going uphill. Hello. (laughs) This is smart. This is God-given intelligence. The enemy has 900 chariots, and they're not going to do them any good up there, is it? are they? 900 chariots? Pfft, so what? We're going to get on a hill. <laughs> a lot of good they do up there. So Israel has the high ground. It's a close location. It's near Refuge City, and it's a safe place to launch attacks from. Now, Judges 4 and 8. And Barak said to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Remember, the Lord said, you're going to win this thing, okay? He goes, if you don't go with me, I'm not going to go. Verse 9, so she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. 
Okay, guys, I just want to sigh when I hear that kind of thing, because here's Barak. He had an opportunity to get up and go do what he told to do, and like I said, they're being spineless. I, well, if you go with me, I'll go, but I ain't going if you don't. Just want to knock some sense into him, don't you? The men are not doing their jobs. And Barak's response is not how you react to a command of God. That when God tells you to do something, you should do it. Not, well, I don't know, and, and throw conditions and manipulate it. You, you don't do that. I don't think Barak fully trusted the prophecy of victory that Deborah gave him. And so he's trying to put conditions on it. Go with me or I won't do it. Barak is being a reflection of his culture. His culture was a culture of men who laid down and says, we're tired, we don't want to do our job, let somebody else do it. And here's Barak doing the same thing. Israel is defeated and laying down, so is Barak. Barak is a reflection of what's going on. Now, I think that instead of trusting the prophecy, Barak felt he'd have a better chance of victory if God's prophet was personally there. But good gracious, Deborah rebuked him pretty good for this, didn't she? Boy, she let him have it. You can hear Barak's attitude, but you can also hear Deborah's too, because she says, I'll go with you, but... She said, I'll go with you, but there's no glory for you in the journey that you're taking. In other words, she said, the way you're going about this isn't good for you. The way you're going about this ain't going to work out, is basically what she said. Now remember, Deborah's leadership was given to her because God wanted to shame the men and prod them into action. And we see this very thing being played out right here and how God issued a new prophecy through Deborah that the Lord will now sell Sisera, to the, enemy in, Sisera the enemy into the hand of a woman. Man, if you're not going to do your job, I'm going to hand it to a woman again. You see what God's doing? Deborah is a judge to shame the men, and now that Barak won't act, all right, we're going to give it to a woman. You think after two of these, <laughs> the men are going to start getting it, shaming the men. Do you see how God is trying to jolt old Barak into this? He's trying to shake him out of it. Dude, get up and get busy. And quite frankly, a lot of the men in the nation, and if I'm looking at you, I didn't mean to. I'm going to look up here. <laughs> quite frankly, the men of this nation are laying down on the job. A lot of fatherless children. It's a lot of... Guys, when we go to the abortion clinic, we see men driving their girls to the abortion clinic to make them have abortions. It may not be just her decision. He's pushing her. I've seen that. Men, be men. Be fathers. Be dads. Do your job. And God's trying to jolt Barak into this. Now, although Barak isn't fully measuring up right now, doesn't look good for Barak right now, I do want to tell you that in Hebrews 11, Barak is mentioned as one of the heroes of the faith, right alongside of guys like Samson, David, and Samuel. So Barak does eventually learn to, he does eventually learn to suck it up buttercup. He does get it later, but for now, let's just read on. Judges 4 and 10, and Barak... And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. He went up with 10,000 men under his command, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber, the Kenite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the Terebinth tree at Zanaim, which is beside Kadesh. And they reported to Sesera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him from Harasheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, to Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harasheth Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Okay, so you know when you watch a movie, like a James Bond movie, and the bald guy carrying the white cat, at the end he always gets away, you know, the, the main villain gets away. <laughs> Who got away? Sisera got away. 
Sisera got away. Barak never got him. Barak never did get him. Had Barak trusted God's command to go and get that victory, Sisera would have falled, fell down and died right there. He would have fell down and died right then and there. But he got away because Deborah prophesied it. Okay? This shows us how important it is to be obedient to God's command so that you don't end up having partial victories. There's nothing worse than a partial victory. Well, we, we almost won. No, you're supposed to win, especially in the name of Jesus Christ. This is a partial victory. Partial obedience or lack of obedience is a partial victory, but full victories requires full trust in God. If you want a full victorious life, but this is panning out just like Deborah prophesied. Sisera is not going to fall to Barak. God's prophecy will be fulfilled. I heard somebody tell me the other day, they, uh, there was a guest speaker at a church, and he was speaking prophecy, and the pastor got up in the middle of the man's speech and shut him off in front of the whole congregation and said, we do not talk about prophecy here. In a church, how bad is that? The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is Jesus, okay, because he shows himself through prophecy. God's prophecy will be fulfilled. Sisera got away because it says, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So that's why he got away. Let's watch this play out in verse 17. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. Then he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk, gave him, gave him a drink, and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the door of the tent, and if any man comes and inquires of you and says, is there a man here, you shall say, no. Then Jael, Heber's, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the tent peg into his temple. And it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. And then as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera dead with the peg in his temple. Whew. You think he got the point? <laughs> I think he did, but um, if he didn't get the point, I'm pretty sure it was the last thing to go through his mind. Jack and Stevie ought to love that. As a matter of fact, I got that from Stevie. Yeah, you got your own version. I'll find out later. How oh, funny. So last night, uh, Anna and I were talking about it. Anna said, can you imagine what was going through Barak's head when Jael said the guy is in here and found him dead? I said, I'm more concerned about what went through Sisera's head. We had that little discussion. I'm a little more concerned what was through Sisera's head. So, but for real here, and, and I, I made that to have a little fun, but I want to ask you the question. I wonder what's going through Barak's head right now. This prophecy just played out exactly like Deborah said. Here he is. I could have had that victory. You think Barak got the point. Start being a man. and Do your job. Do you think he's realizing the problem with spiritual laziness. Guys, if you were Barak here, wouldn't you be thinking to yourself that it ended up like this because you doubted God's prophecy? I didn't believe in God, and this is the way it turned out. Shouldn't have gone like this. I think I'd be a bit ashamed of myself for letting it go down like this when the original victory could have been mine, as God would have intended it to. Guys, wouldn't that just wake you up to see how it went down like this. I think Barak may have felt a little shame in this. I should have just done what God told me to do. He keeps giving what could have been mine to women. And God's like, uh-huh, yeah. Come on. Let's get going here. But let's look at how God set up all the conditions for this prophecy to come through. I'm almost done. Back in verse 11, we see that Jael's husband, Heber, he wasn't even home when Sisera came to the tent. 
Remember, he pitched his tent somewhere else, it said. He went off some other place. The Lord must have given Heber some kind of a reason to be out of town at that time, just so that Jael could perform her part in killing Sisera, therefore fulfilling the prophecy that the Lord would sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. If Heber had been home, Jael probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to drive this stake in like this. I think there would have been a fight in the house. You're going to do what? See, Jael had to act the way God wanted her to, and the husband's not in the house right now. There's some things God's moving around here. And so Barak is processing, probably, I would say, I would be, processing all these events of the day, realizing, dude, I better get my faith and my attitude right with God, because he really can do the things that he says he's going to do. Friends, when God tells you he's going to do something, he will do it with or without your help. He doesn't need your help, but he wants your involvement Because he wants you to watch him work. And so when God tells you to do something, don't think it's dependent on you. It's dependent on him. He wants you to be involved with it. Get in and watch what he does. And so the Lord moved everybody into position right where he wanted them to be beforehand so that the prophecy would become fulfilled just like he said it would. Friends, when God says you have victory in Him, when God says go do this and you'll have victory, trust Him and go do it. Don't say, well, hang on, God. Uh, Wait a minute. I don't fully like the sound of this. If you make so-and-so do this and make this happen like that, then I'll go. God's going to go, uh, you just lost the whole victory, buddy. You lost it. It's so much better to just go, Okay, God, I'll do it. Don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm going. Trust me, when I left my career to come into ministry full-time, I had no clue how we were going to get by. Six years later, we're still here. We're doing just fine. Okay, when God tells you to do something, go do it. Trust Him. Now, one thing about the women in JL's culture here, they helped with pitching tents. And so JL had a lot of experience with driving in tent pegs. She was good at it, man. She could drive a tent peg with power and with accuracy. She knew what to do. She, she had been doing it for a long time. And so she had great confidence in her abilities. That when it came time to strike Sisera dead, she wasn't worried that, oh, maybe, what, but what if I miss the peg? Oh, what if he jumps up out of bed and, and, and if I miss and it wakes him up and he jumps out of bed and, and, and maybe he'll jump on me and attack me and kill me instead and oh my gosh, then I'm going to die. Guys, do you realize how sometimes we are our own worst enemy? We invent most of the trouble that we don't even have because we doubt. J.L. was confident, and she knew what she could do was good enough to get the job done. And so she did it. When we, when we make up stories like this with our imaginations, then we lack confidence, and we become our worst enemy, and we invent stories that only our imagination could come up with. And we use that to justify ourselves for all the reasons why I can't do it. I can't do it. When I come up into ministry, I thought to myself, I don't sound like all those other eloquent pastors. I don't have to sound like them. I sound like me. And if you become a pastor, you sound like you. Okay, but it was a it was a confidence thing. And and we come up with reasons why. Well, God told me to do it. But God, here's why I can't, because I lack confidence and I can't do this good enough and I can't do that good enough. So, okay, you need to send Deborah with me because I can't pull it off. You lost your victory. And just and Satan, man, I'm telling you, he just loves it when we do this (laughs) because he steals your victory. He steals it away. He steals your blessing, the fullness of life that you could have. He takes it and runs off with it and says, you lost it because you're saying, I can't. Or because you're not in order, and because you're not in order, you think you can't. So J.L. knew she had the ability. She had skills, and God used her skills. So she went for it, and bam, prophecy is fulfilled, just like that. She already had those skills. Judges 4 and 23. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. 
So, okay, for many years, the Canaanites, Canaanites, they always had the upper hand. All these decades, they always had the upper hand. They're oppressed harshly. Israel's going through a tough time. But today, everything turned around the other way, didn't it? All of a sudden, it turned around. Till this day, God took out the king of Canaan. And from this day forward, there's now a constant decline in Canaanite power now, causing Israel to be stronger. The tide has turned in Israel's favor. Now, friends, the gospel is all over Judges 4. It's all over it. We have a great enemy that looks impossible to take down, but we fight from a place of refuge. We fight from a place of refuge. We have the upper ground. We fight from the victory of Jesus Christ. Friends, you do not fight for victory. You fight from victory means it's already won. Don't go out thinking like you have to win it. God already took care of it. You fight from victory. Israel stood up on Mount Tabor. We stand up on the rock of Jesus Christ. But friends, do not be a reflection of your culture like Barak was. Don't get out of godly order because it will affect your faith. And when your faith gets affected, you'll doubt God and you won't obey and then you'll miss the fullness of the victory. When you don't fully trust in God's way of doing things, you'll mess up your you'll, you'll mess up mess up on getting the full victory. You'll mess up on the task, and you will end up passing your job role off onto others, and they will walk away with the victories that you're supposed to have. Victories that's supposed to be yours will end up with someone else. JL got the victory that was supposed to belong to Barak. So do your job God's way. If you're operating out of order, ladies and men alike, both of us, all of us, then heed Deborah's warning. If you're operating out of order, heed what Deborah said. She said, there will be no glory for you in the journey that you are taking. If you're doing something that God's word says, don't do it like this, there will be no victory, no gain for you in the way you're going about it. Well, it's my life. I can do what I want. You think Israel said that? Well, God, it's our life. We can do what we want. Putting you under oppression anyway, because he wants you. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't give you the victory through you. He gives it through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to give you some encouragement. Do not doubt your abilities. Don't doubt your abilities. If you have no, no or low confidence in yourself, it's only because you're not recognizing yet the great abilities that God has blessed you with. You have great... Okay, let me put it to you this way. The job you have, the family you're with, places that you are, you are strategically placed to develop skills. Skills that can be used for God's kingdom. Don't walk with a lack of confidence saying, well, I can't, Lord. If God gives me a command, I can't, I can't, I can't. You have skills. Do you think J.L. thought that driving tent pegs would glorify God in any kind of way? Her tent peg driving skills brought forth a prophecy. God has blessed you with skills and talents. And if you'll just be faithful, you'll find that you're already so proficient at it that you can serve him with great confidence when he calls for you to act on it, just like J.L. did. Now, I hate to run the pun by you again, but are you getting the point? Are you getting it? You can serve him with great confidence. Men, do your job. I'm going to say that again. Men, let's go do our job. Do your job. Gals, ladies, do yours. Everybody get in God's order, and when you serve Him with obedience, and if you serve Him with confidence, then bam, you will get to see God's promises fulfilled. Isn't that good? Father, I thank You for today. Thank You for Judges 4, Lord God. You showed us a lot of good stuff in here. And uh, Lord, I pray for um, anybody in here today that's operating out of order. They're doing something they know they're not supposed to be doing. Lord, you've already indicated to them it's not going to turn out well. And for some reason, some people just don't want to turn. Lord, with the pressure that you have already applied, Lord, I ask today that you cause some people here today or hearing me on the radio to finally turn. 
Why should we have to let it get so bad before we finally cry out to you? Lord, incline your people to just bow the knee today. To go ahead and get right with you today instead of waiting until it gets so much worse before so much damage can happen. Lord, bless your people with the the momentum to turn around, to see it, to get the point, and turn around and say, I can't do this anymore. I need to finally get right with you and repent and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we have all forgiven. Sorry, Lord God, that we've done that. Thank you for sending your Lord, uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ to die in my place. For anybody here that you have not fully repented of your sins, today is the best time to do so because you might not get tomorrow. Turn and repent of your sins. Say to the Lord Jesus, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I give my life to you. I now do things your way. I know that means i got to leave things that I probably used to like doing. I know it means i got to say bye to some, some great aspects of my life that I always have, but they're sinful, Lord God. i got to leave them. I'll leave them behind, and Lord, you show me where to go. Lord, I'm not going to manipulate the terms. I'm not going to say, yeah, but if you this, or yeah, but if you that, like Barak did. I'm just going to do it, Lord God. I'm just, I want to be right with you. Lord, cause your people to turn. Show them that your blessing is much better than where they've been. We give our lives to you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.